We also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. Now check this out in verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. But we have the mind of Christ. Now what does that mean? I can tell you what I don't believe it means is that I, through like some guru and through me reaching some level of um, Christ-like mindedness or, or some state of Zen, that I'm walking around 100% of the time, 24-7, with Christ-like thoughts. I can tell you, that's not the truth, right? It, in that way, I do not have the mind of Christ, and neither do you, right? We just don't, if we're honest with ourselves. So that's not what it's saying. What it's saying here is we have the mind of Christ because of what you guys have in your laps and because of what I have right here. And in this sense, we have the mind of Christ. And so no matter what I'm going through in life, in my daily walk with God, no matter what situation arises, if I say to myself, I want to have the mind of Christ in this situation, right? I want to know what God thinks about this situation. I want to know what the Lord's mind is in this that I'm going through. The answer for me is to go to God's Word because we have the mind of Christ in God's Word, right? Again, John 1.1 1, 1 tells us that Jesus is the Word of God, right? We have the mind of Christ because the mind of Christ has been revealed to us in God's Word, right? Turn with me just a couple of more pages to your left, right past Philemon and Titus to 2 Timothy 3. I'm just going to further sort of draw this out. 2 Timothy 3, and we're going to look at 16 and 17. So all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so it's important to note there in, in verse 16 where it says all Scripture, right? It's a, it's a very, very good translation of the original text. All just means all Scripture, right? Which means we don't get to pick and choose only the things that we believe to be relevant out of all Scripture, right? And this is... You see so many people out there today that would tell you things like we need to unhitch from the Old Testament, right? Or our church doesn't study prophecy. Or we don't touch the book of Revelation because nobody can understand the book of Revelation. It's not for us, right? But what about this scripture, right? Are, are, are we to cut this scripture out as well where it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God, right? And really the issue is there, whether it whether it's me or you or, or any other person that, that doesn't like certain portions of Scripture, really what it boils down to is an issue of authority, doesn't it? So if, so if I say to you that we shouldn't study the book of Revelation because I don't believe that we can fully understand it and all it does is cause division within the body of Christ, well, now, who's the authority, right? I've just made myself the authority over God's Word. And I can't do that. I don't have any authority, right? You don't have any authority over God's Word. And, and, and anybody that gets up and claims to be a pastor, a teacher of God's Word, that would say things like that really know what they're doing. What they're doing is they're taking a position of authority over God's Word. Right? Because God's Word, by the authority of God's Word, says that all Scripture is theonoustos there, where it says given by inspiration of God. In the Greek, 
original text, the word is theonustos, which is sort of a, you guys can say it, theonustos. Theonustos. Yeah. It's a two-part word. It's a compound word. The first part of the word is theos, right? Meaning God. So if you think about the word theology, what is that? It's the study of God, right? Theos means of God or of the divine nature, right? The second part of the word is noustos, spelt with a P-N, right? If you think of, and so noustos, the, the root word of that means to breathe or wind driven or spirit driven, right? And so theonoustos is literally God breathed, right? So if you think about like a pneumatic power tool. Some of you guys might know what a pneumatic power tool is, right? And it's a, it's a power tool that runs off air. And it's essentially a dead instrument if it's not connected to an air hose and then further connected to an air compressor. It's just going to sit there and it's not going to do anything. It's like dust, right? So too, the writers of the Bible are like the instruments in God's hand, right? You can think of them as dead instruments. They're dust without the breath of God flowing through them and breathing to us the Word of God, right? And so all Scripture is theonoustos. It's, it's, it's God-breathed, which means it carries that, that authority, right? I don't have, again, I don't have the authority to, to supersede my desires or wants upon the Scripture, right? Paul believed this almost in a scary way. Right In Acts 20, 20, 26 and 27, Paul says this when he's addressing the elders in Ephesus. He says, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. He's saying that from a position as an apostle, right, to these elders and pastors that are over the church of Ephesus, right, and it would appear that Paul actually thought that he was going to be guilty of the blood of men if he failed to declare to them the whole counsel of God. If he, if he cut out certain parts of the counsel of God, that their blood was going to be on his head, is what he believed. This is can, God actually says a similar thing to Ezekiel back in Ezekiel chapter 33 when he's calling Ezekiel to be a watchman. Right? In Ezekiel 33, 7 and 8, he says, So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman over the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Right? And so... I say all that to say that God is not playing with declaring the whole counsel of God, right? And so it's a fearful thing for someone um, claiming to be that, that in a position of authority and cut out certain portions of God's Word just to appease people in their sins, right? And not talk about, thing that, not talk about things that might drive people out of the church, right? It's not, it's not anybody's job to add to the church but God's, right? What He calls people to do is to be faithful to His Word, right? And so we, we as Christians are called to look at all Scripture and to receive the whole counsel of God, right? And so, and, and here's the thing about all Scripture is it says it's profitable, right? And if you think just simply about that word, it, it profits me. God has given us His Word for our profit, right? It's profitable for us. He didn't, he didn't have to give us His whole counsel, right? But He did that because He loves us and because He knows what's good for us, right? And so the first thing that it says it's profitable for is doctrine, right? And so what does that mean? It's profitable for doctrine, right? You can think of maybe a simple way to think about your doctrine or my doctrine or, or doctrine is worldview, right? What's my worldview? What's your worldview? What's your doctrine, right? 
And your worldview, or you could say your doctrine, is what you believe about God, it's what you believe about man, and it's what you believe about the world that we live in. Right? And so what the Bible is declaring here is that Scripture is profitable for a correct worldview. Right? And so it's profitable for me to have a biblical lens or perspective for proper views on God and man and the world that we live in. Does that make sense? And so here's the thing about worldview is everybody's going to have one, right? I don't get to say, well, I don't like what you're saying and I don't want to have a biblical worldview and I don't want to have um, a Marxist worldview and I don't want to have this, you know, I'm, I'm just going to opt out. I ain't going to have a worldview. God has wired us in such a way to where you're you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna believe things. You're gonna put your faith in things. You don't you and I don't get to just opt out and say, "Well, I'm not gonna have faith. I'm not gonna have a worldview. I'm not gonna believe certain things," right? And for the person that says, "Well, yeah, yeah, I'm just not gonna I'm gonna unsubscribe from it all," right? Well, then your worldview is nihilism. They have you know they have a word for that, and it's nothing new, by the way. Nihilism just means that you think life is meaningless and that there is no truth, right? And we're all just here for, for no purpose and everything is meaningless and, and you're not going to subscribe to anything. That's nihilism, right? And I can also tell you that the, the nihilist probably has a big flair of postmodernism, right? And so everything's meaningless, right? But if there is such a thing of truth as truth, well then truth is relative. In other words, my truth can be my truth, and your truth can be your truth, and it's all based on whatever your culture or your experience might be, right? And so nihilism with a flair of postmodernism is tend to, you know, would be where that person would fall. And the danger about that is where that line of thinking ultimately ends up is deconstructionism, right? Which is sadly where we see America headed today, don't we? You ever wonder why it just seems like there's so many groups out in the world today that are just confused and they don't, they don't want to subscribe to any sort of truth? And, and when someone rises up and says, no, there is such a thing as absolute truth and we do have certain beliefs and, and faiths that we can stand on, every chaos just breaks out, right? Riots. And, and there are these people that just want to tear everything down, right? That's, that's when you don't have a correct doctrine, when you don't have a biblical perspective and a biblical worldview, that's where it'll inevitably always lead, is just ultimately nihilism, postmodernism, and then let's just tear it all down, right? And that's, by the way, how you know it's <coughs> demonic and that it's rooted in Satan, right? Satan is a destroyer, isn't he? And so anywhere that you see this lack of truth and lies, and let's just tear it all down, you can be sure that that's rooted in the demonic. Yeah? It says it's profitable for reproof, which, which, which ties right into to what we're talking about, right? What's a, what's a reproof? It's a thing by which I can test something to be true, right? That's a reproof. And so let's say I have an idea idea. And I think it's a good idea, which is typically what happens when I have an idea. I just immediately think it's good. Yeah. And, and I come to you and say, hey, I've had this good idea. And, I'm, and I even think it's from God because, you know, it sounds so good. And I say, I don't believe that there's actually a literal hell because God is love. And God, because He's love, would never send His children to hell. That's a good idea I think I just had and you should believe me because it's loving, right? What would you say to me? <laughs> right? And it's, yeah, where did you get that? Right? But furthermore, what we should be able to say to such ideas is, what does the Bible have to say about that? Right? The Bible can be my reproof to crazy lies like that, right? As good as they may sound, the Bible is our reproof. It's, it's our measuring stick, if you will. How do you know that a stick is crooked? 
You have to have a straight stick. And the Bible is that straight stick. And so when we hear people giving us ideas and saying things, immediately we as Christians should always be saying, well, what does the Bible have to say about that? Right? John taught in Acts 17 before he took off to Israel, and he mentioned that the Bereans were what? More noble than those in Thessalonica because they searched the Scriptures daily to find out if the things that were being told to them were actually biblical and true. Right? And so we should be like the Bereans. We, we have the Word of God, which is our reproof. It says it's also profitable for correction and for instruction in righteousness. And again, what this means is that the Bible has the authority to correct us. Right? Whether that be our doctrine or our conduct, we don't have the authority to correct the Scriptures based on our opinions, how we feel, or what people may say to be relevant in our society, right? The Bible has the authority to correct me and to instruct me what is righteous. It's not the other way around. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And in other words, the Bible is sufficient right, for the man of God to have everything that he needs to know what he needs to know about walking as the man of God. In other words, I don't need some other book. I don't need you to write me a book to tell me how to live to be a complete man of God, right? And that's not to say we can't read other books, right? I like to read other books, but what it is saying is that I don't have to have another book to supplement my Bible. And there are a bunch of religions and cults out there that would say, Here, well, here's our other books that will supplement your Bible. And that'll, that'll, they claim are actually equal to the Bible, right? The Bible is saying that that's, that's not the case. Scripture is sufficient that the man of God may be complete. So... Let's turn to Matthew 14 and get into the main text. <laughs> I don't know why the Lord... When I was studying, He was just like impressing that on my heart to talk about daily devotion, really, and how important it is for us having the Scriptures that are God-breathed to instruct us in how to live on a daily basis. So Matthew chapter 14, and let's start there in verse 22. And read through verse 34, and then we'll come back and take a more in-depth look. Matthew 14, 22. Immediately Jesus made His disciples get into the boat and go before Him to the other side, while He sent the multitudes away. And when He had sent the multitudes away, He went up on the mountain by Himself to pray. Now when evening came... He was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw Him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped Him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And so, jump back over to verse 22. And it says there, immediately. right? And so, to give a little context, we're, we're jumping in here into the story, right? And to give it a little context as far as 
sort of what's been going on. The, uh, Mark's Gospel tells us that uh, about a day prior or a couple of days prior that the 12 disciples had just gone out on, um, I guess you could say, their first missionary journey, right? And, and He had commanded them to go out and to take nothing, right? They were only to take a staff. They weren't to bring any money. They weren't to bring any bread. They weren't to bring a bag, right? They, they went out on this missionary trip, and it was a missionary trip in which they were going to be completely dependent upon God to provide, right? And it says that as they're coming back from this missionary trip, that there were so many people coming and going that they didn't even have time to eat, right? And so you can imagine that they're just completely worn out, right? And hadn't had time to eat. And Jesus tells them in Mark's Gospel, He says, I want you to um, get in the boat and go to a deserted place and rest for a while. And as the story goes, they, they get into the boat and they're going over to this deserted place to rest for a while. And if you've ever been to the Sea of Galilee, one of, the first, one of the first things that I learned when I got there, I was expecting it to be like this big sea, right? Like a sea, like it's a sea of Galilee. I wasn't expecting for it to be small. I wasn't expecting to be able to see across it, right? But if you go on like, if you go up on Mount Arbel, what you quickly, quickly learn is from Mount Arbel, you can see the whole sea, basically. I mean, you can, you can look down from there and you can see Magdala. You can see Tabga. You can see Capernaum. You can see across where likely the feeding of the 5,000 took place. You can see where Jesus cast the demon out of the demoniac and, and the pigs ran off the cliff and went in. I mean, you can see it all, right? And so what happened with the disciples is as they're getting into the boat to go to this deserted place, it says that the crowds saw where they were going. And they started running on foot around the sea because they could see where Jesus and the disciples were going, right? And so they get to this deserted place, and Jesus has compassion on all these people that have now beat them to where they were going to rest. And he starts teaching them, right? Because he has compassion on them. And then the day got far spent, and the disciples are like, hey, like, send these people away. The hour is getting late. They don't have anything to eat. Right? Tell them to split. And Jesus is like, no, you give them something to eat. And they're like, we only got five loaves and two fish. It's not near enough. You need to send them away. And he's like, bring me the loaves, bring me the fish. And as you guys know, he multiplies it. And it says that they are all glutted. They're all filled to the full. Right? He feeds likely between fifteen and 20,000 people with these five loaves and two fish. Right? And so that's where we're jumping in there in verse 22 where it says immediately Jesus made His disciples get into the boat and go before Him to the other side while He sent the multitudes away. John's Gospel tells us why He immediately said to His disciples, hey, you, know, you guys need to split and get out of here is because the people and, and no doubt the disciples wanted to take Jesus at that time because of the miracle that they had just saw and they wanted to make Him king. They wanted to force him to become king, right? And so no doubt the disciples would have been joining in with the We all know where their hearts were. They wanted Jesus to set up his throne, right? They were already arguing over who was the greatest and, and I'm going to be at his right hand and you're not going to be at his right hand and, and, and that sort of thing. And so he's like, you guys need to get out of here while I send the multitudes away, right? And so that's sort of where we're jumping in. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat. And the word there for made in the original text is actually probably more like strongly insisted or strongly urged, right? We, had, we know that they had a choice whether or not to get into the boat, um, which is important to note. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. And, but the boat, so I'm going to verse 24. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. So what's this? The wind was contrary, right? Did Jesus know there was going to be a storm? Did he forget to check his WAP, his weather app, <laughs> right? No, 
Obviously not. Jesus strongly urged his, his disciples to get into this boat. He told them to. I want you to get into this boat and I want you to go to the other side. And now the disciples find themselves in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, and the wind was contrary. So they find themselves in this storm, right? Mark's gospel tells us that they had been rowing for hours and hours and hours. This is, this is incredible to, to understand as a Christian, right? Because biblically, we see two different types of storms that God will allow in our lives. One type of storm is a storm of correction, right? And no doubt we've all experienced storms of correction. The, the obvious example of this in the scriptures would be Jonah, right? God told Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to preach to them repentance. And Jonah went the complete opposite direction and he started heading toward Tarshish, right? And God allowed a storm in Jonah's life to bring about repentance and to bring about His will in Jonah's life. Right? I can remember a time in my life, I was probably 19 years old, and I was hanging out with a couple of knuckleheads, and our, our thing that summer, I guess you could say, was we were really into fishing out at Lake Texoma, striper, and catfish, and, and all of that. And this was a, during a time in my life I was not walking with the Lord. <laughs> I was the opposite of walking with the Lord, right? And me and these two dudes, we had this little 14-foot aluminum boat. We had named the USS Ghost Minnow. And we had a 25-horsepower outboard motor. And we would load up... I'm, from Munster. We would load up in Munster and we would put the boat in the back of my buddy's truck and we would put the motor inside the boat and we would load up our air mattresses and our fishing poles and our coolers and other things that we shouldn't have had in our possession and we would go out to Lake Texoma and we would put in and we would just fish all weekend, right? And, and do things that we weren't supposed to be doing. And I will never forget one weekend we went out on a Friday night and we put in at Juniper West is um, sort of a boat dock that you can go to and on Texoma. And we had heard from my uncle, who is this fisherman, this great fisherman, that if you go up into this area called Slickham Slough, which is where the mouth of the Red River runs into Lake Texoma, that's where you're going to catch the big catfish. Right? That's where you can catch the 40 and 50 pound catfish. And we're, that's, what, that's what we're about. right? We want to go up to slick them slew and catch these catfish and so we put in at juniper west and we have everything loaded down in this little aluminum boat and and we're heading towards you have to drive past fob bottom if you're familiar with texoma to get up towards the mouth of the river and it was in the spring and if you've been around texas for a while what you know about north texas in the spring is they have these weather events isolated thunderstorms right Scattered showers, they call them. And so we're cruising past Fob Bottom, and all of a sudden one of these isolated thunderstorms comes over the lake. And I can still to this day, it's the only time that I can ever remember in my life where I thought, I'm going to die. Like, this is it. I'm, this is the day that I die. There's no way we're getting out of this. We're in the big part of the lake, and there are... I don't know, seven or eight foot waves and we're in this little aluminum boat and there's just I couldn't see a way that we could make it to shore so we ended up just heading up towards the river because we thought well if we can just get into the river then at least the winds won't be so bad right at least we won't be in the big water part of the lake and we made it up in there and drug the boat through all of these cattails and these reeds and I was calling out to God right God help us God save us and we ended up on the bank and I was convinced that a tornado came down the river that night, um, but we stood all night long on that bank of the river, and it just stormed and stormed and rained, and I can remember we hid in a ditch at one point when we thought the tornado was coming through, and just praying to God, like, God, if you let us survive this thing, like, I'll, I'll change my ways, right? And the next morning, the sun came out, and we could see all of these big trees coming down the river because of the storm the night before. And instead of changing my ways, 
and going and repenting and confessing my sins and starting to walk with the Lord, we promptly um, opened our beer coolers that next morning and started fishing. Oh, the sun's out, right? And just went on about our business. God had just delivered us out of a literal storm, right? And we just went about our ways. And I can tell you that I spent the next 10 years of my life basically bouncing from treatment center to sober living home to hospital to psych ward to sober living home to treatment center. Just in and out. All of the different types of facilities that they like to coop us up, right? And so obvious storm of correction that God allowed in my life and I did not heed that storm of correction and I paid the price, right? What we're seeing here in this account is not a storm of correction, which by the way, if, if you're here tonight and you're experiencing a storm of correction, you know it, right? The Holy Spirit is nudging you and nudging me about sins in our lives that are causing consequences. There's no, oh, I think I might be in a storm of correction. It's, no, ask the Lord to search my heart and, and, and He'll make it clear if you're in a storm of correction. And the answer to that is the confession of sin, right? To agree with God and say, Lord, I understand that, that this thing has been going on in my life and you've been nudging me about this thing and calling me to repent from this thing. And so now I'm going to confess my sin before you and ask for forgiveness. And the Bible also instructs us to confess our sins one to another, right? And so if I'm in a position where I'm in a storm of correction and, and a certain sin has a hold of my life and I just can't seem to get freedom from it, the prescription in James chapter 5 is that I need to confess that sin to another believer and pray fervently for deliverance, right? The Bible gives a very crystal clear prescription that we are to confess our sins one to another, right? And so if that's the case, if it is a storm of correction, the good news is that the Bible has a prescription for that, and it's the confession of sin. Which, by the way, any time that we're going to experience revival, whether that be in our own hearts, or in a church, or in a community, we'll always see that as part of the revival, the confession of sin. Right? We should always see that as part of a revival. Right? I know everybody, if you turn on your YouTube channel here lately, everybody has something to say about the Asbury thing. Right, And one, one thing that we should see with revival is the confession of sin, not the affirmation of sin. And so if you see a, a movement that people are claiming is revival, and there's the affirmation of sin there where people are being affirmed in their sins, you can bet that that's not a legitimate move of the Holy Spirit. But if you do see confession of sin and agreeing with God, I, I would have a hard time believing that that's not a move of the Holy Spirit. People don't just naturally confess sin, right? Nobody enjoys really doing that, right? But again, what we see the disciples in here is not a storm of correction because Jesus called them to get into the boat and go to the other side, but rather what you could call this is a storm of perfection or a storm of sanctification, right? A storm of edification. And so these are, these are the kinds of storms that no doubt if you've been walking with the Lord for a while... You've come into a situation where God has called you to do certain things. And as an act of obedience and a step of faith, we step into that, right? And say, Lord, I'm going to be obedient in this. And then along that path, all of a sudden it seems like everything is contrary, right? And we say things like, Lord, why did, you <laughs> why did you call me to do this? I was just trying to be obedient, and now it just seems like everybody's against me, and everything's working against me, and I don't understand what's going on here. Right? This is where the disciples are in this story. God, God had sent them to go to the other side, and now it just seems like everything is contrary. Right? And so it's important for us, for you and I, to be able to discern. I say all that to say this. It's important for you and I to be able to discern the difference between that, right? How important is that in our walk with the Lord? Because the different types of storms have different purposes for us in our lives, don't they? Amen. The storm of correction is for me to change my direction. 
the storm of perfection is God is not trying to, 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 to get me to turn around, but He's trying to do some sort of work in my heart in the direction that I'm currently heading, right? In that, in that act of obedience, in that thing that He's called me to do. So look at verse 25. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw Him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. And just for reference sake, the fourth watch of the night would be around, would be between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., right? So if you imagine the disciples getting into the boat, let's say, at dark, right when the sun was going down, now it's been a good seven, six, seven hours that they've been battling this storm and rowing, right? Uh, Mark's Gospel tells us that Jesus, as He's up on the mountain, could see them rowing against the waves, and He's up there praying for them, right? Uh, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 lets us know that Jesus is interceding on our behalf, right? And so that's a picture of of God watching the disciples down there in that storm in that same way God is watching His church right now. He sees us no matter what we're going through and He's interceding on our behalf. Yeah? So in verse 27 it says, But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer. And if you have a New King James Bible like I do, it says there, It is I. Do not be afraid. I think we lose, in our translations, in that New King James translation, I think we lose a little bit of the richness, I believe, of what Christ is actually saying there. In the Greek, His exact words are egoimi, which is better translated, I believe, I am. <laughs> I am. And some of you guys, your ears might perk up a little bit when you hear, I am. Right? It's a statement of deity, really. And if, if you're not familiar with that, flip back with me to Exodus chapter 3. I want to illustrate this. Exodus chapter 3. And we'll start there in verse 13. What's going on here though is, is God is looking upon the children of Israel who have been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. right? And He's saying, the time has come that I'm going to deliver my people out of Egypt. And He's calling Moses to be the guy that He's going to use to deliver them out of Egypt. And he does that in a burning bush, right? And so a lot of you guys are probably familiar with the burning bush. And this is it. So there in verse 13, it says, Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. And so we have God declaring, right, as His name forever and to all generations, that His name amongst many is I Am, right? Which, which just means to exist. And it's, and it's really, if you think about it, it's a, it's a terminology that only God can use, right? And so if I were to say to you, I Am. <laughs> well then now, because 10 seconds have passed, it's no longer a true statement. I would have to say, uh, I was, right? Or if I'm going to be so arrogant as to say anything about my future state, I would have to say, well, I will be, right? Because I live in, in time, right? God is the only um, being that lives outside of time. And so He is the only one that can accurately say, 
I am. And it be a 100% true statement because he's, he's eternal, right? He's eternal, right? And so you might say, well, it's a different word there in the Hebrew. Like we don't see God saying their egoimi, right, in Exodus chapter 3. So do we have evidence of Christ using that terminology in the New Testament? And the answer is, yeah, it's in John chapter 8. And so flip with me there real quick. I'm getting our Bible turning in tonight. John chapter 8. This is really good, though, because... We've all had those people or we've all heard those people that, that would say things like, well, Jesus never claimed to be God, right? And, and I believe Jesus is a good teacher, um, but, but he never actually for himself claimed to be God. Look at John chapter 8, starting in verse 48. Thanks, Jim. John eight forty eight. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? So the Jews are yucking it up with Jesus again, the Pharisees and the scribes. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead, and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Note that. They're asking Jesus, Who do you make yourself out? out to be. Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that He is your God. Yet you have not known Him, but I know Him. And if I say I do not know Him, I shall be a liar like you. But I know Him and keep His word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Check this out. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, egoimi, I am. He uses that same, that same Greek text right there. In other words, he's saying, I'm your guy. And then look what they do in verse 59. Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by. And so the Jews' reaction to Jesus there saying, I am, was they wanted to stone Him. And why? the reason that they wanted to stone Him was obvious, right? Because they knew exactly what He was saying there. They knew that He was, that he was referencing Exodus chapter 3 and that He was saying, I am your God. I am the one that spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. And so Jesus clearly is making a, a statement of deity there. Amen. So check out, go back to Matthew 14, if you will. Let's continue on in Matthew 14. Back to Matthew 14, verse 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Wow. So here we have Peter, right? And it's, it's really easy to pick on Peter for a lot of the things that we see him doing in the Gospels, right? A lot of the mistakes that he made and a lot of the times that he spoke out of turn. Um, but, but let's think about Peter's state right here in our story. He's just gone out on a missionary trip where he wasn't allowed to bring anything. He wasn't allowed to bring any food. He wasn't allowed to bring a bag, any money. He was completely dependent upon the Lord in that missionary trip. And then upon getting home from that missionary trip, you can imagine completely exhausted and hungry and worn out. And then he thought he was going across 
the Sea of Galilee to a deserted place for rest. And when he got there, instead of getting rest, he was called to help feed 15 to 20,000 people. Right? So no telling how long this guy has been up. Yeah? Completely exhausted. And then after he gets a little meal, instead of getting a nap or some rest, he's immediately told to get into this boat and row to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And so then he spends the next seven to eight hours rowing against a storm in a small ship. And so we have a disciple here that is just, com you can imagine, completely exhausted and battered and beaten. And all he's been trying to do is be obedient to what God has called him to do. And now he hears this voice. He thinks it was an apparition or a ghost, but he hears this voice calling out to him saying, Be of good cheer, I am. Do not be afraid. And Peter says, If it's you, um, <clears throat> command me to come to you on the water. So we see Peter's desire there, right? I want you to command me to come to you. Notice the, the order of his petitions there. His first desire is to be near to God. To be near to Jesus. What kind of a disciple does it take when uh, all the chips are down to say something like that? It takes, it takes someone who is willing to risk everything to go to Jesus. It, I mean, he knew, he, he knew that it would cost him his life. If Jesus, if Jesus didn't empower him to come, he knew that the risk that he was willing to take would cost him everything. And so he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. In other words, when Jesus said, come, he was telling Peter, I want you to move from where you currently are in the security of the boat to where I have now called you to be. And as Peter took that step of faith, he got to experience supernatural empowering to walk in that calling. Amen. And so, it, what kind of faith does that take? I mean, it... Peter was the only one, we don't know why, but Peter was the only one who said that, right? He was the only one that, that was, was willing to take that step of faith. And so what kind of faith does that take? It, takes? it takes a disciple that says, that is willing to say, Lord, I don't care what I've been through. I don't care what the circumstances are. I don't care what things look like, but I want you to call me and command me to get out of the boat. I want to get out of the security of the boat and, and experience your supernatural empowering in my life. Right? And so it's admirable. It takes, it takes a warrior, really. It ta that's what kind of disciple it takes, is it takes a warrior disciple to say something like that. And then in verse 30, But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And so, what happened here, right? Now we have our warrior disciple, this, this disciple that was willing to risk everything and was experiencing the supernatural empowering of God, all of a sudden afraid. And the obvious answer is, is that he took his eyes off of Jesus, didn't he? Amen. And when we take our eyes off of Jesus and we get our eyes on our circumstances the natural thing that human beings will do as we look at our circumstances is in turn we'll start to look at ourselves and we'll start to focus on our own abilities 
to get us through those circumstances, right? And we, any time that we take our eyes off of God, off of Christ, and we start to look at ourselves, it's inevitable that we'll start to sink, right? And that's exactly what we see happening with Peter. But, but his response was correct. He cried out to the Lord, Lord, save me, right? Verse 31, And immediately Jesus stretched out His hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And so what we can be sure of is, say we've taken a big step of faith, right? And we've been experiencing this supernatural empowering of God. And then we take our eyes off of Jesus and we, we feel like we're sinking in this calling that God has called us to, right? What we can be sure of is when we cry out to the Lord that He will stretch out His hand and save us, right? He's not going to let you and I sink. That's not who He is. Um, 2 Timothy 2.13 when we are faithless, He is faithful, right? He cannot deny Himself. And so God will always stretch out His hand and save us when we cry out to Him. And then where it says, Jesus says, Oh, you of little faith, right? The, in the original text there, it's not really a phrase. It's, it's really just one word. And it's really, it carries this, this sort of meaning where He looks at Peter and He just says, Little faith. And he he kind of calls him that, little faith. Why did you doubt? And so you can imagine, like, he's walking on the water and he's starting to sink and he cries out and Jesus catches him and he's like, little faith, why did you doubt? But it, what he asks him there is important, isn't it? Why did you doubt? He's, he's asking him a very, very legitimate question. And it's important for, for me and for you, whenever we do doubt, to ask ourselves that, right? Why do we doubt? Charles Spurgeon has this quote concerning this. If you believe a thing that you want ev if you believe a thing you want evidence. And before you doubt a thing you ought to have evidence too. To believe without evidence is to be credulous and to doubt without evidence is to be foolish. We should have ground for our doubts as well as a basis for our faith. And so is there any good reason for my doubt? Is there any good excuse for my doubt? Will any good come from my doubt, right? Is the evidence for the doubts that I'm having legitimate, right? And 99% of the time I can tell you guys that the doubts and the fears that I have, they're, they're absolutely ridiculous <laughs> most times in light of who God is, right? In light of who God is, the doubts don't have a lot of evidence to back them up. There's a gazillion times more evidence to have faith in God than to doubt. Right? Verse 33. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped Him. We're going to have to rock and roll here. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped Him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God, which is the only right response after getting to see Jesus supernaturally walk on water, enable Peter to walk on water, lovingly save Peter when he was sinking, and by the way, calm a storm, right? The only right response after that is to worship Him and say, truly you are the Son of God. And then in verse 34, it says, when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And so, to wrap it all up, all of the disciples got to make it to the other side, didn't they? The, the command of Jesus was the enabling to keep that commandment. When Jesus said it in verse 22, it was going to come to pass. They were all going to get to go to the other side, right? But what we know from the story is that there was only one disciple who was willing to ask the Lord to command him to do something that was impossible. There was only one disciple that it would appear had the faith to say, Lord, command me to get out of the boat and come to you on the water. Right? I want you to call me to do something that would be impossible for me to do on my own. Peter was the only one that, that did that. And as a result, Peter was the only one that got to walk on water. Right? All the disciples made it to the other side. They were all in the boat. One disciple got to walk on water. I want to be one that walks on water, right? And so the question becomes for me, and it becomes for you, am I willing to ask the Lord to command me to come to Him on the water, to command me 
to call me to do something that would be impossible for me to do in and of myself, right? And we all have those things, don't we? We all have those things that the Holy Spirit has been nudging upon our hearts. I want you to make a commitment to go to Wednesday and Sunday service. I want you to get involved in that cleaning ministry, or I want you to be an usher, or I want you to be on the worship team, or I want you to... Whatever, whatever it is, we're all set in the body individually, but we're all called to play our part in the body of Christ, right? And, and furthermore, most of the times, God is always going to call us to do certain things along our walk with Him that are going to stretch us and grow us in our faith. And so there's going to come those times where God is nudging us to do those things. And, and in that time, am I going to be willing to say, all right, Lord, if it's you, command me to get out of the boat and come to you, right? I want to see your supernatural empowering in my life. Amen. I want to welcome that in my life. And we should. And, and why should we? Because He is I Am, right? Mm. Jesus Christ is the great I Am. He was the I Am that spoke to Moses in the burning bush. He's the I Am that we see that just calmed this storm. He claims that I am the true shepherd. I am the true vine, right? I am the truth, the way, and the life. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the God who sees you. I am the God who hears you. I am the God who has saved you. I am the God who is saving you. And I am the God who will ultimately save you. Right? Jesus Christ is I am. And so we can place our full trust and our full faith in Him and, and, and trust in His empowering to walk in those things that He has called us to walk in, right? And the good news is, is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 tells us that He has already laid out all of those works for us to walk in, works which He has prepared beforehand, right? We're His workmanship. And so our role is just to say, Lord, show me those works and command me to walk in those works, and I'm going to trust in Your Spirit not in my might, not in my power, but I'm going to trust in your spirit just to walk in those works. Yep. Amen. Let's pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, we just thank you for your word tonight, Lord. And, and I pray, Lord, that we would respond to you, God, those things that you have placed upon our hearts, those areas of our lives, whether that be some sin or something that's involved in our lives that you're calling us to repent of. I pray that by the power of your Spirit, you would give us what we need to repent of that sin, God, and that we would turn that over to you and be free. And I pray that if there are other areas of our lives, areas that you want us to step out in, to take big steps of faith in, Lord, that you're calling us to, I pray that you would give us that faith. And give us that grace, Lord, that we need to, to come to You on the water. God, we want to serve You. We want to see Your glory. We want to see You work in our lives. We want to see You work in this body. We want to see You work in our community. We want to see You pour out Your Spirit. We want to see revival, Lord. And so do that here. Your Word promises, God, that Your eyes go to and fro throughout the whole earth looking to show yourself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to you, God. Well, look no further, Lord. Our hearts are loyal to you. Show yourself strong on our behalf. Use us, Lord. Enlist us. We want to be used by you. And so, God, we love you. We praise you. We worship you. We thank you for this night. I pray that you would give us all traveling mercy as we go home tonight. And so... Father, we pray and ask all of these things for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.